Some of my memories are probably influenced a lot by hearing my mother speak, but I do know <clears throat> that there were many devastating events and occurrences that my family was involved in. Immediately after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, all kinds of things happened in the community. And um, there was tension beforehand. People were afraid that something was going to happen. And so there was all a lot of worry even before Pearl Harbor occurred. But on that Sunday, the story I remember most vividly is that they were in church. My mother was the church organist, and my father comes dashing in, and he had heard the announcement on the radio that Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, and everyone was stunned. And the minister, who was uh, a young man named uh, John Sasaki, told everyone to go home to their families, but that there would be a candlelight service that evening. And so they went home, and of course, Immediately, there were all kinds of rumors. The FBI was already arresting people. And we heard stories of uh, things like one man who had recently had a stroke and was not able to speak clearly, much less English. And the FBI kept pressing him. And he thought maybe he had mentioned his neighbor's name. And because that man was arrested, um, this man felt so guilty he committed suicide the next day. That evening, when they had the candlelight service, the minister turned off all the lights and he lit one candle. And he said, we have to think of Christ as the light and you, we have to have that as hope. And he sends everybody home. Following that, my mother, being active as a JSCL secretary, wanted to do something to help. The only information people got were signs posted on telephone poles and on buildings. There wasn't a letter that told you what you had to do. Some families were caught short because nobody could read. They didn't know they were supposed to start selling items at whatever they could get for it. They didn't know they couldn't go more than five miles from their home. And so my mother started getting the information out. And when they heard news like there were warehouses where people could store their goods, you know, she would try to get that information out. She was also served as an interpreter. And I remember one story that she couldn't tell without tears in her eyes. There was a lady who lived about two miles from our place, who had a farm. She was a widow. There were three sons. The oldest was severely mentally retarded, even though he was, I think, in his 30s. He still could not walk. He was very small. She had to diaper him and feed him like a baby. And when Mrs. Kimura worked out in the field, she would take this child with her. And the news came to my mother that any disabled person, child or adult, would not be allowed to go into camp. And she had the dubious task of telling Mrs. Kimura that she could not take that son with her. And I I just, she said all she could do was just hold her in her arms and they just cried together. There was, they were so powerless. You know, in those days, you couldn't protest. If they put a, a piece of paper up on the wall and said you couldn't go more than five miles, you couldn't go more than five miles. And when the order came, there was no choice for Mrs. Kimura. And what I think is so terrible about this story is, we didn't leave until the end of May, but they came from the Stockton Mental Institution with an ambulance and orderlies and white suits and ripped that child out of that mother's arms in March. After we were in Fresno for a couple of months, because that's where our family was sent, we were sent from Florin into Fresno, um, Mrs. Kimura got a letter 
from the hospital saying that her son had died. He was in a strange place. Remember, he probably had the mental age of a two-year-old, and he was not used to the food. He you know, wouldn't eat, and he just died. There were a lot of rumors and um, tension, dissension among people. And I know that some people blamed my mother because she was the interpreter, even though she was the bearer of the message. Uh, somebody, some people saw her as creating some of this. And I'm not sure why the Kimuras did this, but $25 in those days was a lot of money. She wasn't able to work. I don't know how they did it, but she came to our house, I mean, our apartment in Fresno before we were sent to Jerome with $25, thanking my mother for all that she had done to help. And I somehow think it was a way to dispel those rumors that she wanted people to know that it wasn't my mother's fault. Let me get back to what happened during the evacuation. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, there are many rumors that went around. One of them was that if you had anything with Japanese writing on it, if you had anything that connected you to Japan, that you would become suspect as being loyal to Japan. And I know that my grandfather had some family heirlooms from Japan that they burned or buried. Everything that looked like it had come from Japan, my dad ordered my grandfather to bury it because he didn't want anyone thinking that my grandfather was loyal to Japan at all. My grandfather left Japan when he was 19 years old. He came on the second ship from Hiroshima in 1889. He was 75 years old in 1942. He had been in this country for almost 50 years and wanted to be a citizen but was never allowed to. So there are all kinds of sad stories. And even as late as 1954, when with the McLaren bill, you were allowed citizenship if you were born in Japan, because until then, you could never become a citizen, not a naturalized citizen. And my grandfather's desire was to be an American citizen. He attended classes but he couldn't pass the test. He was 82 at the time. Now, who can remember the questions to constitutional questions at, you know, in your 80s? And so he was not allowed citizenship. I always regret that. He loved this country. He had no intention of going back, but he could not become a citizen. I wanted to follow that storyline all the way through. Now I'm going to go back to the time after Pearl Harbor when people were struggling to know what to do with their land, their property. Uh, my dad was on the association board. There was a group of Japanese farmers that formed an association so that they could pool their money and ship the crops to the East Coast. And being a member of the board, along with um, some Caucasian board members, they were going to decide how best to you know, support the Japanese farmer. And my dad kind of overheard a conversation that indicated maybe he couldn't trust everybody and asked his good friend, Bob Fletcher, to take care of our farm and two other farms. Other farmers left their farms in the care of this board or in neighbors. And some people were honest, took care of the farms, paid the taxes, because you had to pay your taxes or you'd lose the farm. And if you didn't keep up your mortgage payments, you lost the farm. But uh, because Bob Fletcher was an honest and hardworking man, our farm and two other farms were saved. All those decisions had to be made before we left. Can you imagine you and your family having to make a decision about everything you own?
that you can't put in a suitcase and you only had several weeks to do it. We in Florin were luckier than those in Southern California because their orders came within two weeks. Although the paper has not been posted yet, everybody knew the order was coming. It was moving up the coast. And so as each community got their order, we knew that we would be next. And Florin had a little bit more time to prepare, if you could read English. People did what they could. The day we left, I remember going out into the garden and my grandmother was standing out there crying, looking at her flowers and her roses. And even at age four, I can remember taking my grandmother's hand and telling her that it would be all right. I knew that my grandmother believed she'd never see it again. Many of the Issei's, especially with those that were older, believed they would never see their homes again. And for a lot of them, that was true. The death rate in the camps was much higher. They weren't used to the weather conditions. They weren't used to the food. The living conditions weren't good. And you had people that were hardworking, industrious people that suddenly had all that taken away from them. Along with the stress of losing their farms, their homes, their businesses, and there was a lot of turmoil. The infant mortality rate was 10 times higher in camp than it was outside the camp. Many miscarriages and stillborns. And it's understandable. If you had children and you could only carry <coughs> a suitcase, you had to pack diapers and things for the child so those mothers if they didn't have other people to carry things for them, they had only what they had on their backs. So there was a lot of terrible things that happened to families. But people in the Japanese community had this belief that you have to accept life as it is. I, think, I don't know whether that's from the culture, from Buddhism or what, but you accept fate. And I think most people did the best they could. We were sent first to an assembly center. And what was interesting, <clears throat> when you think about the timing, Japanese farmers were just ready to pick their crops. In fact, they were already beginning to pick strawberries in late April. And so in May, it was the peak of the season. This is the time when you can get the most money for your strawberries. And they needed to be shipped immediately out to the East Coast where you can get top dollar. Well, making the farmers move at that time guaranteed that they could not pay off their loans to the banks. Farms, farmers often borrow money from the bank and plan to pay it back when they get their cash crop. We had two crops, as did many farmers, strawberries and grapes. And I remember my father saying it was a good year. You had more strawberries, it looked like the grape vineyards were doing well, it was going to be a good year. And by 1942, many families were just coming off the depression, getting to the point where they had either leased land, they were doing well, planning to buy property. My dad's mortgage was almost paid for. He didn't owe that much left on the farm. And so it was almost as though they could see daylight when Pearl Harbor occurred, World War II, and the evacuation. And if somebody had a master plan to make sure that the Japanese farmers would lose their property, this timing was perfect because if you allowed us to stay there until October, when the real camps were ready, we would have been able to cash in the crops. We were forced to leave the end of May, May 29th, and I remember leaving from the Elk Grove train station. We had um, a friend, George File, drive us because my dad had already sold the car. And uh, we went, many people had other friends and neighbors drive them. 
my Uncle George, who was 17 years old at the time, and had a Model T, it was his car. Can you imagine a 17 year old with a car that he owned? He couldn't find anyone to buy it. So when he drove his mom and dad and his sister to the train station, he left the key in the car. And he said, what could I do with it? And so he left it for some, whoever was willing to take it. There are all kinds of tragedies like that. People did their best, they lost a lot. And in some cases, they left it with good friends that protected them. So when they came back, their property was intact. My grandmother lost some of her things, but not all. And on my father's side, we didn't lose anything because Bob Fletcher took care of our farm. Going into Fresno on that train ride, I remember I got motion sickness, so I, I think I was car sick on the train, and I know my grandmother was sick. My cousin um, Lester had measles, and so he was, he and his mother had to stay in the, um, uh, the they had a, like a bathroom area in one side of the car, and he was quarantined there. I think it only took, it took more than one day to get to Fresno from Sacramento. I don't know why it took so long, but, um, or it took a long time, at least in my mind. And when we arrived at Fresno, <clears throat> we were lucky. We got there late uh, as compared to others, so we were not housed in the horse barn, horse stalls, or the um, animal buildings. We were housed in temporary barracks. And I do remember that it must have been built on the parking lot because there was asphalt. And Fresno was really hot. I mean, you know, it got as hot as 114. There was no shade. Uh, and so people would try to mill around. And the, inside the buildings, it was so hot, you couldn't even breathe. And uh, I remember my grandmother not letting me sit on the cot because there were, um, there were metal cots uh, with with um, foots, foot portions to it. And if you sat on it, it would sink into the asphalt because the temperature was so hot, the asphalt melted. And I remember walking uh, and the asphalt would bubble. And my grandmother would get so angry with me because I liked to pop the bubbles. And then the asphalt would stick to your shoes and you'd go around and you'd walk and there'd be asphalt sticking to your shoes as you walked on the um, on the grounds. I would wake up uh, in the morning sometimes and there'd be tar in my hair because they used tar paper on the roof and um, it would melt down. In reading my mother's book, she talked about how terrible the, the restroom uh, were, the, the toilets didn't flush properly. What they did was they actually built a trough and every once in a while they would just run water through the trough, and that's how the toilets worked. There were 16 toilets, um, eight on one side, eight on the other, back to back, with no partitions. And I think, I remember, the toilet seats didn't have seats. It was just the, the bowl. That's what I remember, too. So life in the camp, even the assembly camp, was, was not good. In October, we stayed in uh, Fresno for uh, close to six months from May until October. In October, the camps were ready. We were sent to the farthest camp, Jerome, Arkansas, sent on a train. And that train um, would be put on the side often because troop trains or trains that carried um, military equipment was given priority. And so we would be put on the side and these other trains would be allowed to pass. And they also timed it, I think, so that we would try to go through the cities at night. See, nobody wanted people in the United States to know that there were a whole bunch of Japanese people that were being transported across the country. They would make us put the window shades down. But I remember my dad peeking out and saying, oh, you know what, I think we're just passing um, the salt flats, so we must be going uh, past Utah. 
Nobody told us where we were going. We had no idea. We could tell the direction of the train because of the sun, but we, we had no idea of which tracks we were using, which direction we were going, and certainly no indication of what our destination was. It was all by rumors. Um, Jerome, <coughs> Arkansas, uh, is uh, in the uh, south eastern corner of Arkansas in a swampy area. I know that uh, they chose it because even though it wasn't federal land, as most of the internment camps are, a lot of them were on Indian reservations, actually. Um, and they had to make sure that it was pretty desolate. Uh, and recently I learned that uh, the people in Arkansas were very jealous of us because we had flush toilets and electricity. And some parts of rural Arkansas did not have electricity until as late as 1974. And people were looking at us and saying, why are those people getting wa running water and electricity and they're supposed to be the enemy? Um, I recall my mother uh, talking to my dad and saying, Al, I hear that the people outside the camp are really poor. They are living worse than we are. And that was true. In some ways, those who got jobs building the camp um, were taken out of poverty because they were given jobs. Jerome, it was hot and humid in the summer, something that Californians are not used to. There were all kinds of bugs and snakes. There were water moccasins, copperheads, rattlesnakes. Um, the boards that they used for the buildings, because they built it so quickly, and they used wood that had not been aged or cured. So as time went on, especially in the winter, it, the boards shrunk, and there were spaces like about a quarter of an inch and wider. And there were cases where uh, little snakes would get inside the cabins and they told children not to play with it because even a baby rattler is highly poisonous. And I remember grasshoppers uh, getting into the, the apartment. Uh, we had a light bulb, there was a window, a door, and um, we didn't get a stove right away, but in the winter time, they, we finally did get a stove, and they um, had a, a wood-burning stove in each room. The rooms were 16 by 20, and I remember my dad making um, a stool for me out of an orange crate and he made my mother a, a vanity and she got um, made curtains out of, uh, you know, in those days you could get flour and rice in cloth sacks and people would take that cloth and they would make things out of it. And th those are the curtains that we had uh, on our window and on, on my mother's vanity. If you had, you had to use the bathroom, you had to go walking into the center of the compound. And I can remember it getting very, very cold. Uh, for young children and old people, because you didn't want to walk out there in the middle of the night, especially when it was snowing or raining, it'd be terrible. You just can't go to the bathroom, um, you know, in the middle of the night. And so they had something called a chamber pot. And I know they used to use this in pioneer days. It looks like a little pot made out of enamel, and it has a lid on it, and you use that. The bad thing is in the morning, somebody has to dump it and clean it out, and that is the way we lived. You had to go to the what they called a mess hall three times a day, and if you missed the time, you didn't eat until the next meal. Our block, Block 9, um, had... Um, 
pretty good cook. But in some cases, if you didn't have a good cook, then people, as much as they could, would go to the, you know, another block. I know my cousins liked to go to block 16 because they said the cook was better. And some of those teenage boys used to eat twice. If you could make it, you ran fast enough and, and you were hungry enough, you just ate twice. The kids were just running around all over. I remember my grandmother being so ashamed because um, she had three grandsons that were all like between um, uh, 12 and, and uh, 15 and they, got into trouble. I mean, you know, they did things like break into the, the mess hall and steal sugar. You know, these are kids. They were running around on the roof of the, um, the mess hall, you know, probably trying to break in, and they get caught by the MPs. And, and they ran around with the minister's son. And so they were supposed to be like the four worst boys in Block 9, I guess. And, and three of them were my grandmother's grandchildren. <laughs> she was not happy about that. If you talk to teenagers, they had the best time. I think for me, I just remember it being dark and cold, and I was always frightened of being lost. I was afraid of the dark for a long time. Um, I still don't like to be in the dark. And that's because the buildings were all covered with black tar paper. There were no sidewalks. There were no street lights. There was a light on, on one end of each building. But if you couldn't read, and I was five, how could you tell block nine? I mean, maybe I could read nine, but if I passed block 27 and apartment B, or you know, I, I couldn't find anything. Uh, my dad made um, a little, uh, It was looked like a puppet. It was a woodpecker. And he made it out of scrap lumber, and he painted it, and he put it next to the door so that I would know that when I saw the woodpecker, I was home. But it'd always be very uneasy until I got to you know my block. Uh, after a while, people would plant things. They started decorating their front porches, and it was easier you know, to find your way. But um, you had to be very careful of where you went. They started kindergarten. Uh, it was probably not until, so we got there in October. We, I don't think they even started school until March, maybe. Because they, just, they were just too busy fixing the floors that had cracks in them. And, and uh, they didn't have that many teachers. I think they started school for the older children. But kindergarten was not required. And so uh, I don't remember going to school until later in the spring. And maybe they didn't want us walking out in the snow, because it was snowing. Um, I hated the milk. I don't know what kind of milk it was, but it, it just smelled bad. And I was told it was goat's milk, maybe because they had goats around there. But if you had money, if you had a nickel, you could get a half a pint of milk in a bottle. And um, I remember lining up and, and getting the milk. And if you brought the bottle back, then you could get that milk for um, three cents. And I remember crying because this boy bumped my arm and my bottle broke. And I didn't have a nickel. I only had three cents, so my cousin gave me her nickel, and I drank that milk. It tasted so good, because it wasn't goat's milk. Um, other memories that I have, my mother was uh, in charge of the YWCA program for the whole camp, and she got $16 a month. My dad was in charge of the um, recreation hall for Block 9. Oh, he loved that because my dad was, a, was an athlete in high school and he would organize um, basketball groups and then for the older people he had um, chess boards and checkers and, and this Japanese um, game that the men would, would play was called Goal. 
and there was another one called shogi, and they would make their own boards. Um, people did a lot of handcrafts. They had to make do with what they could get. And uh, I remember my mother uh, organizing different activities for uh, the young ladies and, and the men in the camp. The 442 was started as an all-Japanese American segregated unit, because in World War II they had segregated units. And it was felt that Caucasian soldiers, or what they called American soldiers, would not be willing to fight next to a Japanese American because they wouldn't trust them. And the, the young men in Hawaii were demanding to be allowed in the military. They were uh, classified as C4, which meant enemy alien, just because you were of Japanese ancestry. And these, they said, okay, finally they passed legislation that would allow an all Japanese unit. It was going to be an experimental one. They were going to let a thousand men in. It's going to call it the 100th Battalion. And there were already a lot of uh, Hawaiians that had been trained in uh, well, ROTC programs. And so the majority of the group from the 100th Battalion was from Hawaii. They were sent to North Africa. Because they had to prove their loyalty, they were fierce fighters, and they were sent up against uh, the tanks, German tanks. And so they took heavy casualties, but they were successful. And they fought better than other men they, because they had to prove their loyalty. Because that was a success, they said, OK, we will organize another battalion. And this time, we're going to let more men in. They wanted 3,000. Uh, and they were going to train them at Camp Shelby, Mississippi, which is the, not that far from um, Jerome. They recruited about 1,300 young Nisei boys from inside the camps. And they said, if you want to join and show your loyalty, then join the military. And so they recruited them. Well, when they got to Camp Shelby, there was a cultural clash. The Hawaiians had never faced the kind of discrimination that the boys from California and the West Coast had. And they were there to, you know, have fun. They, they liked to play the ukulele and they loved to gamble. They would get cookies and packages from home because their parents weren't in internment camps and they still had jobs. And the boys from camp, they had nothing. They were poor. Uh, and they were serious. They were the ones that were fighting because they wanted to get their parents out of the internment camp. Well, when they would gamble, the boys from Hawaii would lose. And you know, when you lose and you, when you're gambling, you're supposed to stay in the game and give the other guy a chance to win some of his money back. Well, these boys from the, the mainland, they took the money and ran because they didn't have any. Well, that caused a rift. Uh, and then the Hawaiians didn't like them because they were too serious. And they didn't like the boys from California and the mainland because they spoke uppity English. Well, if you've ever been to Hawaii, you know that they speak a different kind of English. It's called pidgin. And this is what most of those Japanese American boys from Hawaii spoke. And when the mainland boys spoke, they spoke standard pretty much standard English. It wasn't perfect, but the Hawaiians felt they were being uppity. And so there were fights. The commander was getting ready to disband the group because he said, you can't make a fighting unit out of boys that are fighting like that. And they decided that uh, they needed to do something. There weren't that many Hawaiians that were put in internment camps, but those that were ministers, whether you were Christian or you were a Buddhist priest, a teacher of karate or Japanese, you were suspect. Many of them, 2,000 of them, were sent to Jerome. And so there were Hawaiian families in Jerome. And the commanding officer thought, well, maybe these boys need to go talk to somebody from Hawaii. Let's send them over to the camp. Well, how do you get young boys to go to an internment camp? My mother organized USO parties. 
And so the boys were taught, you can go on this field trip to the camp, they're going to be girls to dance with you. And so they signed up and they went. They went to both Jerome and to Rohrer. Um, and uh, Daniel E. Noah, who becomes a senator from Hawaii, tells the story. He said, we were telling dirty stories and jokes and playing the ukulele. And you know, he drove out there, it took, I don't know, four or five hours to drive. And he noticed that when they came here, he thought, oh, we must be going to you know, military camp. That's where they're having this party where all these girls are going to be. And, uh, and my mother would take a few girls to the gate, and they would meet the buses, and then, you know, escort them to where they were having the dance. And Daniel Linoa says that when he saw these people behind the barbed wire fences, he suddenly realized they're in jail, they're in prison. And he said, Everybody was silent on the bus, and we tried to have a good time, but he said, you know, it was, it was the realization that the families of these boys are in prison. There were other trips like that, so that many of the boys got that experience, but it was that moment that the two factions the 442, the Hawaiians and the mainland boys, uh, became a fighting unit. And I can't help but being a little emotional because um, so many of them died. They had a 319% casualty rate. 30% of the Japanese American young boys volunteered for military service as compared to 10% nationwide, three to one. And they died at a faster and higher rate. Why? They become the most decorated unit in all of military history because they were put to battle more often. They were sent to the harshest, most severe battles, those that you know, were suicide missions. And they had a cause. Um, so it was a high price to pay. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the 442 and 100th Battalion. They combined the two groups and they called them the 442 slash 100 because they started out as separate units, but they were the all Japanese American soldier group, a military group that fought in Europe. and. Um, they become known as, uh, as the regiment, the, the only regiment of its size and length of service uh, to have won uh, more decorations than any other in all of U.S. military history. And that includes the Revolutionary War, Civil War, any war after that. It's an incredible record. And my dad's I call him an adopted brother because he was taken in by our family at age 12 and lived with my dad, was in the 100th Battalion and fought in Anzio and took some of the heaviest uh, casualties in, in his unit. That 100th Battalion becomes known as the Purple Heart Battalion because so many of them had more than one Purple Heart. Anyway. After the training is finished in, in Camp Shelby, the unit is shipped, I believe, to first to Italy and then to France. And um, even though they, I don't know which area they, they went in Italy, but they c are the first to arrive at Rome and ordered to sit by the side of the road and they are not allowed to enter Rome as the victors because they're waiting for a Caucasian unit to come marching past them. Later they are sent to France, and towards the end of the war, there's a city called Brères, and it is near the French-German border. It is one of the last strongholds, and the Germans are determined to keep it. They had sent a battalion in there earlier, but the German troops were too strong, and they're turned back. Um, the 442nd is ordered in, 
and it's in the black Vosage forest area of, of France where the trees are very thick and it's dark. When they are sent into a village, it's difficult because there are, are uh, German machine gun units hiding in, inside these buildings. And originally, it, they were supposed to um, shell the, the city and destroy these uh, German uh, nests of uh, machine gun fire, but that wasn't done. And they were ordered in before that happened. And therefore, they took heavy casualties. It took them five days, but they win the Battle of Barreres. And even today, every year, the townspeople of Barreres hold a special celebration, and they have a pilgrimage to the burial sites. So many of them died and were buried there outside uh, Barreres in the cemetery. About at the same time, there was a, a group of Texas soldiers who go f eight miles in past the German lines and get surrounded. And being the end of the war, the German command orders that these troops be annihilated because Germany needs a psychological victory. And although it's just a small unit of 200, they don't want to let these boys out. Two units have been ordered in, but they get turned back. And after the Battle of Barreras, the 442 is supposed to get two weeks of rest. <coughs> Excuse me. But in less than five days, they are ordered out. And in talking to Roy Ueda and a couple of other soldiers that were in that group that survived Barreras, um, they told me they were angry because as they were ordered to march, and it was, I don't know, uh, 10 or 15 miles, and they were walking past U.S. troops sitting on the side of the road next to their trucks in clean uniforms, meaning they hadn't seen battle. And here these guys were, they hadn't even had a chance to change or shower, and they're ordered in. And when they get there, there's a, a, a snowstorm. Uh, the conditions are very, very bad. It's in the middle of winter. And as they are ordered in to rescue this lost battalion at all cost, at all cost, um, they take even more heavy casualties. Two things happen. One is they move through the Black Forest, uh, and my dad's adopted brother is one of the first casualties. They're, they are hit by um, shrapnel caused by friendly fire. Friendly fire meaning it was the United States artillery that miscalculated the height of the trees. And as they shelled the area trying to clear the way for these boys, they were killing their own men because the shells were hitting the trees, bursting, and the shrapnel was landing on them. Um, Pedro Uchida was, was that person, and he never got over it. He was a platoon sergeant in charge of 12 men. They all died, and he was the only one that came out alive. He never forgave himself for that. But they go in, and when you hear the story of this battle, the forest was so thick, it was so dark and so stormy, that the men pinned toilet paper on their backs so that they could identify their own troops. And there were times when they literally bumped into German patrols going through that area. But in the five days, they reach the lost battalion and get them out. And for that, they get um, some kind of recognition for their, their troop. General Dahlquist, who is in charge of their group, orders a uh, regimental review uh, because it's a chance to celebrate. You know, they won two battles back to back. It was highly publicized. And when they lined up, uh, he turns to his colonel and in an angry voice says, I ordered all the men. I don't want any slackers. And the colonel had tears in his eyes. The general didn't even realize that he lost a third of his men in the two battles. And so the troops that were able to stand were the only ones left. Even after that, um, there's another battle in which the 442nd 
uh, distinguishes itself. There was a, a place called the Gothic Line, and for almost six months, the United States was not able to pass this line. Again, it's towards the end of the uh, war. And there's a slope that goes straight up like that, and on top of this high hill, the Germans had uh, their guns positioned down towards uh, the United States and the Allied lines. And of course, you know, you get out there in that open field, you're just an open target. And the 442nd was ordered up that hill. And they said, no, give us 24 hours, we'll find a better way. What they did was, the reason why the Germans were not worried about it, there was a slope this way and there's a cliff on the other side. In the middle of the night, the boys in full gear climb up that cliff. Two people die, but they don't make a sound as they fall because that would warn the Germans at the top. They climb all night and arrive there early in the morning, just past five o'clock, and in 28 minutes they'd taken the hill. But again, now uh, in that particular battle the casualties were not heavy, but the 442nd in those three battles uh, distinguishes itself. To President Truman's credit, after World War II ends, he desegregates the military, and thereafter there are no segregated units. If you want to look it up, the Tuskegee Airmen, that's another segregated group. There were the Navajo um, wind talkers. There were isolated segregated groups during World War II. Uh, and since then, the military has changed. I believe that it was due to the bravery of the soldiers that really helped us to win the hearts of the American people, the public, and to have people realize that the Japanese Americans were truly loyal. And what more can you do than to give your life? And a lot of Japanese American boys did. So. Um, that's that record. Our family left uh, Jerome, and I didn't learn until later why. In the camps, there was dissension between those that were bitter, and some had been educated in Japan, perhaps feeling that uh, it might be better to return to Japan, so there was that faction. And then the Japanese American Citizens League were the ones that sort of defended uh, America as, as a democracy that uh, would, in the end, eventually set things right. People believe that. And uh, the Japanese American Citizens League urged the young men to show their loyalty by going into the military. And there's still some controversy over that, because a lot of young boys died. And because of that tension, if you were a leader in the Japanese American Citizens League, there were some groups that were after you. And there was a, the president of the JACL named Saburo Kido, who was in Jerome, and he was beaten uh, in the middle of the night. And my uncle, who was then the president of Florin JACL, uh, drove him to the adjoining camp, which was 50 miles away. It was in a town called McGee, and that camp was Roar. My aunt was afraid that my uncle would be next because he was the current president of Florin and JACL. And she warned my mother that my dad, who is the past president, would be next on the list. Uh, we heard from Dori Kobayashi that her father had to leave Tule Lake because as a former national president, he was in danger. So there was tension. All was not happiness inside the camps. And of course, you had people that had a right to be angry. And uh, you had people that were advocating uh, leaving Jerome and going to Tule Lake and de denouncing their citizenship. There were all kinds of meetings, and I know my mother was very, very disturbed about the things that were going on. I'm going to tell one short story about an 18, uh, she was a 17 year old girl whose parents had decided to go back to Japan, and she did not want to go. She said, I'm an American, 
I don't want to go. And she cried and she spoke to my mother. And my mother agreed to try to help her. Well, she came to our door in the middle of the night with her suitcase packed. And my dad drove her to the other camp, Aurora. Uh, and of course, it'll, uh, her family was very angry with my mother. Um, and they finally did get together. And I do believe that although her family did go to Tule Lake, she did not have to return. Uh, she did not have to go back to Japan. And I don't even know whether her parents did. But families were split. There were families that were split over the issue of joining the service. Some parents, of course, did not want their son to put their lives in danger, and the young boys wanted to be patriotic and to show their loyalty. And the unwritten hope was that if they showed their loyalty by proving that they could be good American soldiers, that we would be let out of the camp. And the 442nd gave their lives, and the military intelligence service boys in the Pacific gave their lives too, but the promise was never kept. And it was never written. It was just maybe implied. Um, we left camp and went to Jerome, I uh, went, went to Kalamazoo, Michigan. If you were sponsored by somebody, you could go out. And uh, my aunt had gone and found a job, and so she helped us to move to Kalamazoo where my dad worked in a bakery. So you could get jobs where you could not be seen. He worked in a bakery. He was the baker. He took care of the ovens and worked all night. And so nobody, you know, people didn't know that he was working for that bakery. It was Peter Pan Bakery. And my uncle worked there. Uh, later, my uh, mother's father came and uh, her sister and her husband, and so a lot of us ended up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, and I started the first grade there. I remember I was so afraid, and I think I was afraid because children were curious. Some were um, aggressive. They pinched me. Um, they called me names. Uh, they pushed me. And so um, this family that sponsored us, or, or was assigned by the Methodist Church to help us, the Mortons, had their son, Richard, who attended a junior high that um, really wasn't close by my school, but he would make it a point to um, walk me to the school and then go to his school because I was afraid to go uh, by myself. I remember I spent a lot of time hiding uh, we went on a field trip to uh, the library, and I couldn't read very well. Um, and so I spent most of my time, I think, in the bathroom. Uh, there were other times when it, it would snow, and we were on the, the second floor, and what we did was instead of going outside to the playground down the hallway, you just climbed out the window and went down the fire escape because it was you know, a quicker route to the uh, playground. And and I remember uh, my teacher always urging me to get, get ready to go out. And it was cold and snowing, so you would put on a snowsuit, you'd put on galosh shoes, and I would take the whole 20 minutes getting dressed, so I, probably so I wouldn't have to go out. Um, but I did have some good friends. Uh, there was a, a little boy named Walter and my uh, neighbors across the street, the Jakeaways, that I would play with. Uh, but I don't think I had too many friends at school. There was still a war going on. Many of the ch children had fathers that were ser or uncles serving in the Pacific, and they did see me as the enemy. And comparing notes with my cousin, who was in camp the whole time, they had a much happier childhood. They were not exposed to the kind of discrimination that I think my family did. I remember going with my mother to get meat at the butcher shop, and she couldn't go to the one that was close by because she heard they don't serve Japanese. Um, and so we would have to walk a long distance, and my mother had arthritis, and this was at a time when there was no treatment for arthritis. So it was 
very, very hard for her. She was in a lot of pain with the, the cold dampness of the snow. And we would take uh, my wagon, and it didn't have very good wheels because this was wartime, and uh, we couldn't afford a, a very good wagon. It had wheels that were made out of plyboard. And of course, in the snow and in, in the wet water, uh, the plyboard began to split and to come apart, and so the wheel was uneven, and it would be difficult to push that wagon in the snow. But my mother couldn't carry things because of our arthritis. And so we would walk together in the snow uh, to this one butcher shop, and we would always be practically the last ones to be served when all the good cuts were gone, and there would just be the pieces left with tendons and, and gristle. Uh, so I remember that part um, about my experience in Kalamazoo. And of course, there were happy times. I mean, there were wonderful people. The Mortons were, were so helpful, the Jakeaways and the people that lived on our block. I think when you get to know people, then you accept them as individuals. But when they are strangers, then you only judge them by what your prejudices tell you. My dad uh, borrowed my uncle's car, and we drove cross-country back to California. And I remember that was a tremendous experience because the tires weren't very good. But in those days, if you didn't have a coupon for a tire, you couldn't buy one. And each town had a limit. So when we had uh, problems with the tire, uh, my dad had to try to find someone who was willing to even sell him a spare tire or a retread tire. And towns were not willing to give tires to strangers. So I remember being stuck in some town in Texas for a couple of days. Um, and uh, on the way back, we stopped in Arizona to visit my grandparents and my cousins who were in Gila, Arizona. Um, and in 1946, we came back to Florin. And we were one of the few people that had our farm left intact because my dad's friend, Bob Fletcher, kept the farm. He and his, uh, his wife moved out into a smaller one-room building and used that as a, as a house. He put a kitchen in there for his wife uh, and gave us the house because he knew that there would be more families. And I do remember three and four families living with us until we could they could get settled, and my dad would um, have them help on the farm. Uh, we would just pool all of our resources, and women you know, would take turns cooking. But I just remember a lot of people, we would just literally sleep on the floor with a blanket. And uh, the children slept in the hallway. You know, We just lined up and just slept. Um, I think there must have been 14 or 15 people in a two-bedroom little tiny house. Um, and people lived in the uh, Buddhist church and the uh, Methodist church in Florin, in the gymnasium, the same way. They would put up their boxes, their suitcases, wires with blankets on them, and just cordon the place off. They would take turns in the kitchen. And I don't know how they lived. I know some families lived there for two or three years. There were families that stayed there. Those are the hostels, they call them. But um, there were families that took other families in, and that's how we uh, survived after the war. Well, I think in history, you have to learn, look for the truth. And there are all kinds of events and incidences in US history of interest, no matter what your ethnic background, if you're an American Indian, or if you're Irish, or you great-grandparents came from Sweden, you'll find that people made judgments against any new group. The internment of the Japanese Americans was a horrendous violation of constitutional rights, and I think that's what makes this particular story a little different. Other than the African Americans and the American Indians, I don't think other ethnic groups have had this kind of violation. It's important to look for the truth. It's important not to judge people of the times, because I think although there was a lot of prejudice against the Asians, 
at the turn of the century, people were raised that way. You were raised to mistrust. You were raised to believe that only your people, people who look like you, can be trusted. We now know that with DNA, we're going to find a lot of things that might make some people feel uncomfortable about how we truly are not that different and how interrelated we are. But when you look for the truth and you find ways to look for the best in people, I think we can learn lessons from history. We need to be able to speak out. And I know I was critical of my mother for not speaking out at that time. But the more I learn, I realize you didn't have a voice because the circumstances didn't allow you that voice. Now we have a voice. We have a responsibility. If you want to maintain anything that seems like the nation that we hope to become, you've got to take responsibility. You cannot just take things for granted. We live a very comfortable life. And although a lot of people may not feel that way, you look around, yes, there's poverty, yes, there's this, yes, there's injustice and unfairness. But overall, we still live in a wonderful country. And it can be better. And I'm not sure that we're taking advantage of what we have. And we need to stop and think and make it better. Because if we don't, we could lose some of the things that we have right now. And that's why these stories and these lessons are important. They are important for us to help us think. Nobody's going to tell you what to think or do. You will come to a point in your life where you will be responsible for what you say, what you do, how you act. No matter what your your background and your circumstances, there comes a point where you can't use that as an excuse anymore. So that's why I think these lessons are important. I know that there was um, a, a farmer, uh, last name was Larson, and uh, he took care of uh, some of the orchards. The orchards needed to be pruned, the orchards needed to be watered, and he did his best to uh, take care of uh, the orchards that belong to the farmers in the Placerville and Loomis area. And, and there was another person, um, and I don't, I, I'm not even sure which community he was in, but somewhere in, in the Hill area, um, who started helping people, and his community drove him out. He had to leave, and he could not return until 1945. Um, so there were people that did try to help, but had paid a price. And uh, you know, I know that the the Wagels, there were lot, many, many people that helped. And if and when you talk to the families that had anything salvaged, it was always somebody. You know, even if you had money and you tried to protect yourself, it was very hard to do that if you didn't have an outside Caucasian person who could take that responsibility. Um, we were given a help in Kalamazoo. We could not have lived there and, and made that start in Kalamazoo without help. Uh, of individuals that, that stood up, um, you know, I know that the Brethren Church, uh, we often hear the word the Quakers, there was a Brethren group, and uh, we're going to be doing an oral history of, um, I, I heard the daughter's name is West. Dr. West is a, a law professor at uh, Davis. But her parents were teachers in Manzanar, and what they did was to open these hostels in Chicago and New York. And without those hostels, you could not leave. People could not leave the camps unless they had a place to go. They could not start a new life without some kind of assistance or help. And if it hadn't been for uh, the Schwetzers, Smetzers, Smetzers, starting these hostels, uh, thousands of people from many, many camps would not have had that. 
that start and the opportunity. So people did stand up. Uh, churches, some churches stood up. Uh, How about a, just a final thought you might want to leave us with? Something you haven't been asked you'd like to talk about? Well, I guess I do this because I think it's important to tell. I tell the story not based on my own experience, but what I heard my mother say. And I think it's so important. Early on, she recognized that this was a story that had to be told, so that any kind of um, incarceration without due process would not be allowed uh, to happen to any one group for any reason. Uh, the second thought is that she, early on she recognized the need to tell people about those that helped. Florin JCL was one of the earliest groups to recognize community members who had been helpful. And, uh, you know, we, we need to recognize that because they paid a price. They won't tell you they did, but they were shunned. They were seen as traitors in their own communities, and it was hard to stand up for people, just as it is hard to stand up for people now. Um, the Lodi JSCL and other groups stood up for um, an Arab family that uh, was accused and of course the father was accused of lying and part of it was because he didn't speak English. He told two different stories at two different times uh, and um, was later found innocent. But we have to remember that it still goes on today. And if you look around, there are people that are not being treated fairly. And it's usually somebody that's poor. And what does that tell you? If you can afford a high-powered lawyer, some people say you can get away with almost anything. You know, and, and you know, we look around and it just seems as though some people who have been accused of murder get off because they have money. And that's not what is fair and that's not what this country should stand for. <laughs>